Hello and welcome to this very special interview for the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Today I have with us a very special guest. She is a well-known and award-winning journalist who has covered from various topics relating from national politics to Jammu and Kashmir and much more. She is none other than Nidhi Rajdhan. Hi Nidhi, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? So Nidhi, my very first question to you is that after the billionaire Gautam Adani took over NDTV, we saw a series of resignation after that and even by some very prominent faces including you as well. So what changed? What made you resign? And well, I'm not going to go into the details of, uh, you know, of my resignation except to say that it's very obvious uh, that uh, I, I felt that it was time for me to move on and that the circumstances <coughs> were such that uh, I didn't feel uh, comfortable continuing and so I felt it was better that I uh, move on. Not an easy decision because it is an organization I've grown up working in since I was 22 years old uh, and it has been more than 22 years since I was there. Uh, but uh, that's what life is like. Life is about change and uh, new challenges. Right. Can you recall a time when you found it most challenging to do a story or an interview and why? This well, question actually, is especially for the boarding journalists. Well, there, there are many such examples. Uh, if you talk about physical challenges, uh, the earthquake in Gujarat in Bhuj in 2001 was a particularly challenging story because there was so much devastation, destruction. We didn't have a place to stay. Everything had been destroyed. So we had to stay in a tent for four or five days with no food. We only had to carry water and biscuits from Delhi uh, with us. And that's all we ate for four days. Uh, and also just, you know, there was so much de devastation. Everywhere you look, there was just you know, uh, the Red Cross or some other hospital, makeshift hospital that had been set up. Uh, there was no electricity, there was no water, we couldn't have a bath for four days. So there was a physically very grueling story to do. Uh, you often, and this has happened more than once, when you interview somebody, uh, you might find that they are very difficult subjects. They may give you one word answers or very short answers. Right. Uh, that has that has op often Any happened. Any particular person you do want I to I remember name? Digvijay Singh once okay. of the Congress this, suddenly I remembered that one day, a couple of years ago only, we were doing an interview and his answers were like, yes, mm -hmm. no. So was he reluctant in giving that interview? He was just being what? difficult that day and I started laughing at one point and I made a joke out of it and I said, Aaj mm -hmm. to nahi karna chahe. you know, something like that. So right. you make light of it, you find a way to, but you must persist, you must continue to do it and move on. So today we see lots of UAPA cases, defamation cases being slapped on journalists like Siddiq Kapan for that sake. And many more like that, Irfan Mehraj for that sake. Journalists are trolled online today. They get death threats, they get rape threats, even acid attack attempts. So why after all of this should students opt for journalism as a career? Look, journalism is an exciting and a wonderful profession. If it's done the right way, it is a profession that gives you the opportunity to tell people's stories. Uh, you get to document history. You are a storyteller. You get to tell the stories that affect people the most. And there is nothing more exciting than that. Personally, as a journalist, it's also a great opportunity to meet different kinds of people, to go to different parts of the country, travel to different parts of the world if you're lucky. So it opens up uh, uh, spaces for you which otherwise you may not ever see or hear. So, so to that extent, it's still a wonderful profession. And I think it's the job of a journalist today is actually even more important because when uh, we go through difficult times when journalists in particular face difficult times it it takes a certain courage uh, of conviction to stay the course and to document what is happening around us so yes despite these um, incidents that you mentioned it doesn't take your toll on your mental health i'm sh it does i mean i know like for for me the trolling is not something it's not great but life throws up all kinds of challenges in whatever profession you're in uh, whether you are a journalist, you are a doctor or whatever you are in. So I think it's a question of how you navigate those challenges. And right. it's important to persevere. I'm saying this ironically when I have left my own position at NDTV only recently. Uh, but I continue to do write. I continue to write my pieces. I continue to write for a newspaper. So I haven't given it up. And uh, I don't know what I'll do tomorrow. But, you know, uh, I've, I'm just finding a different way to express myself. Maybe not through TV but through something else. But I'll do it. So, uh, I think it's important to stay the course, particularly when the going is tough. So, in your career, in your over two and a half decade long career, you have reported on several, you have reported several times on Kashmir as well as POK. 
So what are the challenges that you face in the field while reporting in those times? And that to the time when the terrorism was at its peak? Well, one was the, I mean, the sort of uh, security aspect of it very much. So POK was particularly challenging because uh, we were uh, sort of being followed around by the ISI everywhere. They were being difficult. They were not letting us go to a lot of places. They didn't want us to do interviews, but we still managed to do a lot of clandestine interviews of uh, uh, people who had crossed from the LOC from the Indian side and gone into POK and had trained as terrorists there and they were regretting their decision. They wanted to come back to India. You know, they just said that uh, this was how they were brainwashed, etc. Uh, and all of that was part of my documentary. After that, I got blacklisted by Pakistan for nearly five years. I couldn't go back to do any reporting from there. Uh, so they were very agitated by all of this reporting. Uh, so that was a very difficult environment in which to report. It was also physically difficult for me because I was down with some kind of viral while I was doing all this. So, uh, you know, uh, all, all of those factors, you know, came into play. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, those have been challenging assignments. So what was, sorry, I'm interrupting no, you. So what ahead. was the reason why um, you were suspended by Pakistan? Was it because you went out of the box, out of your schedule? No, to I mean, cover, I did a documentary which people? also showed that they, I mean, uh, I talked to like, uh, you know, uh, terrorists that, that they had trained who came on camera to say that they had been trained in camps there and how they were, you know, you know, they had been promised uh, ideology, they had been promised jobs, they had been, you know, that none of those promises came through. So they didn't like that. They didn't like being exposed. So that's why I got blacklisted. So you write in your book, and I quote you, you write, the wounds have not healed and still run deep. We say Kashmir belongs to India, and yet it is almost as if the rest of the India has abandoned the Kashmiri people. There is no attempt to understand their alienation and pain. There is no political outreach. Since you started reporting, so you saw three successive governments. You saw Vajpayee's time, you saw Manmohan, Dr. Manmohan Singh's time, and now the Modi government. So, what difference do you see in the approach towards Kashmir and the willingness to re resolve the Kashmir conflict, the issue of Kashmir? Oh, look, well, as far as this government is concerned, there is no conflict. There is no issue. So, uh, I think, in a way, one good thing that they've done is they've cut Pakistan out of the equation. Because I think whatever, you know, Pakistan does has been nothing but create trouble for Kashmiris. So, I don't, I, I actually agree with that. Uh, but I think the, the mistake one makes is that uh, there is, again, um, a very sort of uh, security, uh, uh, the, uh, how do I put this? They approach the issue through a security prism only. And that is where I think like in order to win over the hearts and minds of people, you have to understand people. You have to make an effort like you don't, they get vilified. Kashmiris get vilified in the mainstream TV channels, for example. Uh, they face difficulties in other parts of the country, getting hotel rooms or in, in colleges and schools, etc. So I think there needs to be a greater uh, winning hearts and minds, which is what Mr. Vajpayee only talked about. There has to be a better understanding between Delhi and Srinagar. I mean, also JNK doesn't have an elected government now for five years. How is that right? You know, so I'm just saying that 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 gap has to be bridged and not through propaganda and just, just saying Naya Kashmir doesn't make it Naya Kashmir. Uh, the rest, I think, you know, uh, is, is, is that's the government's policy that it has decided to follow and fine, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Pakistan, etc. I think ultimately you need to have dialogue. Uh, but as far as Pakistan's position on Kashmir is concerned, uh, I think it's good that they've been sort of put in their place on that because they've done nothing but export terror. Right. You further write in your book, that today's nationalist narrative has only increased the distance between New Delhi and Kashmir. There is a deep political issue that needs engagement. But in these national times, it is not fashionable or politically correct to talk about alienation. So why do you feel so? And because this is even you, the same not, thing. If this you, is even if the you same say thing the word alienation, that A.S. Dolat in it, his recent memoir, uh, yeah, Life in Shadows, Dulat, talks about. Mr. Dulat was... Uh, the head of the RNEW and he was uh, a fine intelligence officer who served there. I'm not even that. I'm just a Kashmiri myself. I'm just saying if you say the word alienation today, every party spokesperson of the of the ruling party will jump down your throat and say, Ki kahan se? everyone is so happy. I mean, if you're not going to uh, be honest about the issues that you have with your own people, then how is there an honest dialogue? That's all I'm saying. Great. So back in June 2017, 
when you were debating on the beef issue the, the person the bjp person has resigned from egalia and what is for that you are sambit patra to sambit patra bjp spokesperson sambit patra to leave your show when he accused you of the agenda that ntv has at that moment only the following week at that moment did you think of the future repercussions it could cause and also in the same week ntv was raided so do you think it was a repercussion of that it was a consequence of that you are asking him to leave i don't think so i don't think sambit patra is that important that uh, it led but to but he went on to threaten C- you on yeah. C- C- cbi raid no i think that that was something that was in the making for a very long time let's face it there were cases against ndtv etc so that was that was sort of a uh, consequence of that uh, it it at that time of course one didn't think the actually the repercussions of that was that bjp decided to boycott ndtv so they they i think i don't know if they've come now but till recently they were not coming on our channel officially no official spokespersons were sent on our shows uh, so that was the actual outcome of that incident i have subsequently also looked back on it and wondered whether i did the right thing only because as a journalist i have i'm in a dilemma about this i do, i think it's important to call out nonsense like saying agenda driven journalism and so on but i think as journalists it's also important to keep your cool and be dispassionate and um, you know one could have maybe put him uh, you know told him that one didn't agree with him and then you know continued rather than allowing it to escalate so yeah. uh, i do sometimes think whether i did the right thing so coming to my last question you have reported over a long span of time and even before that you have been one long so if you today get a chance to go back in time and change any five events that could change the discourse of the politics forever what will those five be i wouldn't change anything because you wouldn't I, alter anything i wouldn't because this is the way it was meant to be i mean why should you shouldn't alter history watch back to the future it's nice movie if you try to meddle with the past you can't firstly but if you did uh, it has consequences for the future so things have things happen and uh, you know you just have that's life but I again would, we don't see that in normally we see the ruling party going back in the past for that i'm sake. not i'm not here to crit, uh, criticize or praise any political party uh, as a the journalist the country seems to go backward rather than talking about that's the future that's a different issue i'm just saying that i would not i mean i am not here to sort of change the destiny of this country I mean I I that's why I'm saying that whatever has to happen it it plays out the and you know if people are not happy with the way things are they will vote out a government or they will vote for somebody else if people are happy they'll continue with them that's what happens in a democracy Thank you very much Sadi for a very engaging conversation Thank, Thank you, you so much Thank you